What's up, everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this Indie Explained, we are checking out Sister Death, the prequel to Veronica from a few years back. What's great is that Sister Death feels quite different from its predecessor, eking out its own identity and story that reveals the origins of the woman who became Sister Death. Imagine if the Nun movies were actually good, and that's kind of the vibe here. So let's check out Sister Death, breaking down the story, including what the entity is all about, and explaining the ending that ties us back to Veronica. Static pops and an old-timey recording words into action. There are several people gathered in a circle in a dark room. There's a young girl that they are surrounding with her head pointed up. We learn that this is in the streets of a small Spanish town back in 1939. The little girl holds up a cross along with many, many others. She prays to the heavens and gives the cross a kiss. The girl is then out on an overlook holding out her arms. And then as she walks through the street, crowds of people fall to their feet and she gets bombarded by the crowd, everyone trying to get up on her with her crosses. Clearly the girl is thought to be some kind of religious miracle or or as the chapter title tells us, the Holy Grail. We pick up 10 years later with the now grown up girl, Narcissa, on her way to join a convent of nuns. She stops at a wall riddled with bullet holes and Sister Julia joins her and informs her they used to be a closed convent before the war. They all had to be evacuated and no plaster could ever cover up the shame of what happened. The war here referring to the Spanish Civil War that occurred from 1936 to 1939, so just ended really. Once there was peace, the church took the building back and turned it into a school for girls with low-income backgrounds. Only her and Mother Superior returned, all the other nuns elected to leave. Narcissa is concerned about fitting in as she isn't fully committed to God yet, and Julia assures her that they are all equal within these walls. Julia goes to tell Mother Superior that she has arrived, and already there is something supernatural afoot. Out of nowhere, a small marble rolls out onto the floor and stops right in front of her. She looks around the hall for the source, but finds nothing and gets a startle from Julia. Narcissa meets Mother Superior, and it appears that her reputation precedes her. Mother boasts of her work from when she was a child. It was thanks to her that they could have faith in a difficult time and gave them the strength to overcome obstacles. She shows off a newspaper clipping, remembering how word spread of that holy girl from that lost village in the mountains, even being known as the Virgin Mary. They assume that she must get asked about it all the time, but Narcissa sheepishly admits that she doesn't even really remember. She was just a little girl. Mother then recalls writing to the bishop for help, and they are so happy that it's her that showed up of all people. She smiles and says that she is delighted to help. She learns that the church have also approved for her to take her perpetual vows, the important final step in becoming a nun, vowing yourself to poverty, chastity, and obedience. Fun! The news hits Narcissa hard, noticing that the ticking of the clock suddenly stops. Her job will be to teach several subjects for the girls, acting as a replacement for Sister Inez, who had to leave the church to take care of her ailing parents. Or so the story goes. They read a quote from when Narcissa was a girl, and it sounds like the whole thing is that it was believed that she was actually in communication with the Virgin Mary. It wasn't easy for the girl, and the only brief relief that she would get was from telling Mary her every thought. The peace was quick to leave, and the pain of her martyrdom would begin again. Narcissa checks out her new modest digs, and well, of course you gotta have a massive cross on the wall, that's for sure. She peers around the walls, one painting catching her eye. She unpacks her suitcase, noticing a self-flagellation device inside, which is pretty hardcore. In the closet, she pulls down an old suitcase to discovering an ornately carved cigar box hidden in the back. Inside, she finds a pair of scissors and some letters appearing to belong to her predecessor, Sister Inez. There's a photo of another sister, Socorro, lying dead in a casket. Suddenly, there's a rhythmic knocking at the door. A rattling rings out and a chair nearby flings itself on its side. There's more aggressive banging from outside the door and she looks around, finding nobody around. Definitely a spirit trying to reach out, I'd say. Distressingly, she sees a hangman drawing on the wall with the head and body already on there. Just a few more steps until the game is complete. In service, a pastor leads the nuns in prayer, and there's more weird rumblings. She stares at a statue of the Virgin Mary, and it's almost like she's wondering if the voice is back from her childhood. She visits the confessional to atone for her sins, and admits that she is scared to be here. It's not just that, but she's having serious doubts about herself. You, the Holy Grail, the priest asks. She's surprised that he even knows her, and he says it's all the nuns have been talking about for days now. He's curious if it was the Virgin Mary that told her to take her vows, she says that it wasn't. It was actually her choice and even felt that it was her duty. People came from all over to come see her in her village and ask her questions. The problem is she didn't know how to respond and wanted to get as far away from all that as possible. She grows emotional believing that she could have just gotten away. She could have lived a normal life and maybe Mary would have come back to her. He feels the Lord brought her here for a reason. She just has to figure out what that is exactly. She is doing her sacrificial duties and fast regularly as well. He can't believe 
believe that even after all that, she still has doubts. And Narcissa wonders if she only saw what she wanted. What if what she saw wasn't Mary at all? She was given no signs of any kind to prove their identity. And the priest now understands her plight. She's lost. In the morning, it's time to lead her first lesson. The children all snapping to attention when she enters. She jingles a little bell, and they all pray to the Virgin Mary, of course, pleading for her to look upon them with compassion. She introduces herself and starts writing her name on the chalkboard. This causes the students to get nervous and chatter amongst themselves. She tells them to cram it, and the kids are still frightened by her writing for some reason. One girl, Rosa, is so scared that she even has an accident. Narcissa doesn't understand why, but allows the girl to leave along with her sister, Elvira. She flips through a book along with Mother Superior, seeing photos of her own anointment back when she was young. Narcissa is taken aback by her youthful appearance, and she laughs. Oh, so I couldn't have ever been young and beautiful? She even suggests that if she hadn't become a nun, she would have most likely been a cabaret dancer, both chuckling at the thought. She scans through more pages, finding photos for several dead nuns, similar to the Socorro one. On another page, it appears that one photo is missing and was torn right out of the frame, and I'd imagine it's Socorro's that's been removed. This sends her back to that box in the closet, and as soon as she looks at the photo, the chair knocks itself over, strongly suggesting that it's actually Socorro's spirit reaching out. She carefully puts it right side up, and there's more loud raps on her door. She calls out, hello, and the banging continues, followed by distant sobbing. Narcissa gets closer to the door and leans in, hearing a girl crying, mommy, where are you, mommy? She flings open the door to nobody there, and another marble rolls up to her feet. It starts rolling again back along a crack in the floor, disappearing into the darkness. The supernatural rolling carries on, and Narcissa curiously follows after. It clanks down a staircase, sending her into the basement. The marble is still rolling, hearing a gentle breeze and hushed whispers. She's surrounded by a bunch of stuff covered in tarps. Must be a storage area. She sees something on the ground wrapped in fabric. She unwraps it, finding a hand inside. She shows it to the other sisters, and they're curious why she even went down there in the first place. Narcissa isn't sure why, and Mother thinks that she knows. It's the voice of the Lord guiding her. She's found the long-lost hand of Sister Martha that was thought lost since the war. Together they pray to the Holy Queen, asking to show her eyes of mercy upon them please. Taking us to chapter two. If she writes your name, you're cursed. Well, that doesn't sound good. It must be why the kids were freaking when she wrote her name. Narcissa is wandering the grounds and overhears Sister Sigario mumbling to herself. She's surprised that she's still working so late after midnight, and Sigario scowls that the girls mess up their tray of specialties. The trays are all full, but they don't know which flavor is which. The only way is to do a taste test. The first one, rose water, Narcissa guesses, and in the second one, she detects a hint of alcohol. Sigario winks that that is the secret ingredient and takes a big swig from a bottle of booze. Oh, nuns. Narcissa offers to help her, and she thanks her, calling her Inez. She hands her another one and orders her to eat it all in one bite. She chokes down the rest to her satisfaction. Sigario demands that she has another. Specialties must be eaten in pairs. Is that right? Narcissa tries to turn her down, and she shrieks, they must be eaten in pairs. She aggressively hands her another, and Narcissa shovels it down her gullet. There's some odd squelching noises heard in her mouth, and Sigario begins to laugh maniacally. She gags and reaches into her mouth, pulling out an eyeball. There's no specialty, Sigario cackles. She hacks up several more eyeballs and, still laughing, shields her eyes and flies away backwards. She lowers her hand, seeing that her eyes are now missing. Narcissa shrieks and wakes from the bad dream. Some girls stop by her room, telling her that she has beautiful hair. What a shame, though, as when she becomes a nun, they're gonna cut it all off. They both freeze at the hangman on the wall, now with another arm added on, and one step closer to completing the figure. In class, there are a ton of girls missing, learning that on Wednesday they all help out with laundry. They even wash linen for people in the nearby cities and other families that donate to the school. The girls are hopeful that it will help them find a good post when older, or maybe even a husband. Narcissa attempts to help, and the girls put a stop to that. Sister Julia will not allow it. She tiptoes around what happened in class yesterday, Rosa supposing that she was scared. The blackboard, the sisters say in unison, when she wrote her name. She tries to dig further, but the girls shut her down, smiling nothing and walking off. Obviously hiding something. They're all back to praying again in service, as always to Mary, Mother of Grace. Narcissa grips her rosary tightly, running a finger over the bees. She squeezes one, and it bursts like a ball of blood and begins oozing down her hand. The others' voices distort into a low growl, and she spots a nun lying dead on the floor. They begin to lift into the air right in front of her. She stops and stares at her with blood dribbling from her lips. Julia snaps her out of her daze, asking for help with final prayers for the girls. She finds them all having a little dance party and scolds them. 
Daddy gone mad. What if Mother Superior found out? The girls point out, well, what happens if when we're older and we go to a dance, but they don't know how to dance? So they ask her to show them some moves. She must have been to lots of dances before coming here. Narcissa caves to the demands and instructs the girls to get into pairs. Two steps to the left and two steps to the right. That's pretty much all it takes. The whole group giggles in delight, twirling around the room. After a little bit of fun, it's time for bed and the girls do their goodnight prayers. Later, a girl, Anna Maria, needs to use the restroom and wants Rosa to accompany her as she doesn't want to go alone. Rosa hears something getting on edge. There's the sounds of the door rattling and keys jangling. She asks the girl if she can hear it as distinct footsteps are heard getting closer. It's the girl, she gasps. Anna Maria calls her an idiot and Rosa laughs that she will go with her, but now she doesn't want to go. They go anyway, hearing more odd noises behind him. In a room, Narcissa is indulging in some self-flagellation, crying in agony, and asking for strength from the Lord to help her grow spiritually, to always fulfill his will, and not to fall into temptation. In the bathroom, Anna Maria gets to business, and Rosa hears water running in the tub. She notices a pair of scissors, which sure look a lot like the same from the cigar box. Anna Maria rejoins her, and they turn off the water. Just about to leave, the water starts violently sloshing, hearing a girl screaming, No! No! <laughs> Narcissa settles herself after her session, hearing someone weeping. Rosa concerned sees what looks like a lock of hair going down the drain. Narcissa turns, seeing a figure in the mirror, and the chair topples over again. Rosa yanks out the long hair and Julia enters, hearing a girl again shrieking in the distance. Anna Maria is somehow still in bed and cries that the girl cut her hair, but it's Rosa that gets the blame, calling what she did unforgivable. They ask where she got the scissors, and Rosa argues that she didn't do anything wrong. She appeared in the bathroom and was asking for help. Julia shuts this down quick with a hard smack across the girl's face. She sends Narcissa Narcissa away, grumbling that there's no need losing sleep over these bad girls. She returns to the box and brings the picture along to the nearby graveyard, where she does find her burial spot. In class, the girls are praying as usual, acting as though nothing is wrong, but Narcissa notices an empty desk, Rosa's. Concerned, she searches the musty basement, and the girl has been thrown into an old jail cell of sorts for her sin. That's kind of messed up. She offers her some food, and Rosa refuses. She has been told to fast to atone for her sins. Narcissa is after the truth. Where did she get those scissors? She explains that they were already down there, but what about the girl? The girl in the water, Rosa replies, hanging her head. She doesn't think that it matters what she says. She won't believe her anyway. Narcissa promises that she does, taking the girl's hand, and Rosa has bad memories of going through something similar with Sister Inez. After she told her, she didn't believe her after all. She spills that there is a girl's spirit that lives in the school, and you must and play with her or touch her paintings. Uh, must be like those paintings in Narcissa's room. Inez completed the last line on a previous hangman game on the wall to try to prove to Rosa that the spirit wasn't real. But then the girl wrote Inez's name and she left the school in terror. As the chapter says, if your name appears, that means you're cursed. Narcissa is bestowed Inez's old dress for her upcoming vows and she can't help but ask about what happened to her. Mother understands the girls must have told her their story, chalking it up to them having too much time on their hands. She lays the blame on Inez's lack of of discipline. If she had been harsher to the girls, it would have been better for all of us. Don't go following down her same footsteps, she warns. She leaves to get a tape measure, and Narcissa lays the veil over her face. Wind begins blowing, lifting up her veil, and it begins to tighten around her face. It gets tighter and tighter, making her unable to breathe, and something squeezes at her core. The pressure becomes enough that the dress's buttons start popping off, revealing marks on her back. She wakes up terrified and drenched in a cold sweat. She becomes even more so, seeing another limb has been added onto the hangman. In class, the girls are going over the different types of eclipses, and one in particular that due to the positioning causes rays of sunshine to not reach the moon. It creates a coppery glow, allowing the viewer to make out details of its surface. The light that does reach it is bent, and we remember the importance of solar eclipse in Veronica, where it allows dark spirits to attach to people only during that specific time. The girls bring up the dangers of staring right at the sun. Yeah, you don't want to do that. You could go blind. Suddenly, Rosa tenses up and flees from the room, and we see what came over her. Her name is now scribbled on the chalkboard, meaning she's cursed. Uh-oh. Narcissa comes to comfort a sobbing Rosa and says that she truly does believe her. She believes that she did see a little girl, and importantly, she needs to see her for herself. She takes her to the hangman, confirming that it resembles the same one with Inez. She approaches the drawing, and Rosa grows frightened, pleading for her not to touch it. She maintains that she just wants to see the girl and convinces her to finish the last line of the hangman together. This is clearly a very bad idea, but she does it anyway. 
anyway, now there's a kind of selfish aspect to Narcissa's motivations here. If she can actually prove that the spirit is real, then she will feel that the Lord is talking to her again. She is quite desperate to have this back, and this foolish act makes it obvious. They complete the mark, and Narcissa scans the room for anything out of the ordinary. Nothing, she declares, almost sounding disappointed. Now we know why. She tells the girl to see for herself. Nothing happened. But then the chair gets knocked away. Rosa grows terrified, whispering, she's here. Narcissa reaches out a hand, grasping at the air. And Rosa is baffled. Why can't you see her? She's right there. Narcissa complains that she can't see anything. And Rosa tells her not to move. It's not a girl, but it is trying to say something. What she's saying, Narcissa asks. And when she spins back, the girl has vanished. She runs frantically through the school, screeching for Rosa. She texts to laundry, and her sister hasn't seen her either, sending her to check other rooms. She bumps into Julia, explaining that Rosa has gone missing. She goes right for the offense, scowling the more you believe her lies, the worse things will get. She disagrees, truly believing that there is truth to her story. Julia laughs and now thinks she has her all figured out. Now we know why the Holy Grail came here. You want to solve a mystery and get back in the papers. You practice the words and motions, but it's all a fabrication. You know it's a sin for someone like you to take those vows. Sure, she may have fooled those people all those years ago, but it was all lies. Or maybe what she truly saw was in fact the devil. Elvira runs back and with no sign of her sister, believes that she must have been taken just like Inez. Uh oh, they kept saying that Inez left, but maybe that wasn't the case. No, nah, definitely not. Narcissa here is what sounds like Rosa whimpering from within a confessional booth, but the door is jammed stuck. She enters the other side, looking through the window. The door slams closed, trapping her within. The confessor tells her hello and to take a seat. Is that you? Narcissa asks in befuddlement. Don't you recognize me? The voice says. You think this is one of your nightmares, but no, this is real. She says she just wants to find Rosa, and the voice chides her for taking advantage of that poor girl. You wanted to know. You wanted to see. Same. Kind of her fault, really. The voice distorts, growling. You don't always need eyes to see. She hears kids giggling and leans closer into the grating. An eyeball appears there, telling her, you know who I am, and a sea of eyeballs appear, filling in all the holes. Someone grabs her from behind, with Julia's words about not being good enough ringing in her ears. Hands grab all over her body, completely covering her and making her unable to escape. She screams and somehow manages to get outside, still hearing Rosa praying somewhere. The door creaks open, revealing Rosa there hanged by a noose. Well, like the voice said you wanted to see and you, there you go so you happy now or yeah. and we move into our final chapter sister Socorro where our story really comes together everyone is gathered around Rosa leaving flowers and blessings and her sister is not handling it well Narcissa tentatively enters the room and gets emotional at the sight Julia shows up to bust her balls again you trusted her and now she's dead like I told you you don't belong here if you just listen this tragedy could have been completely avoided she returns to her room and the chair is already on its side she puts it back in place place and slams it angrily several times into the ground, letting out a guttural yowl. She packs her bags, shambling out of the school, appearing defeated. The girls pause as Branch's shadows dance across the floor, and we know a solar eclipse is coming soon. Narcissa continues slowly walking, and the eclipse is about to take over. She drops her bags and falls to her knees, staring directly at the sun. Don't do that. Isn't that the whole point? She holds out her arms and begins convulsing. Julia notices her out in the grass, mouth agape. The sun becomes briefly completely blocked, and a brighter, pure white white light takes over in the edges like a ring. This moment is taken as a religious experience for Narcissa, her eyes now blind, but she smiles with new resolve. And like the voice just said, you don't need eyes to see necessarily. Julia appears and grabs her cheeks. As though touching her allows her to see her innermost thoughts, Narcissa is overtaken by tortured screams. Fire is being set ablaze and a statue of Jesus catches on fire. She's been teleported back to that night of the raid with the soldiers. In the chapel, they are all holding the nuns hostage and acting like a massive wankers. They storm the place, breaking statues and everything in their path. Julia tries to bring her back, and Narcissa is shot to another moment. She approaches a chicken coop, hearing a woman crying, and see a dude having his way with her. She screams awake to Julia, telling her to calm down. She passes a flashlight over her eyes, which she can still faintly see, but the light doesn't hurt, she says. Meaning she's pretty much blinded herself. Julia is cold on her concept of this being spiritual. You did this to yourself. It's neither repentance or penance, but rather an act of arrogance. But as Narcissa knows, she did actually see something. She saw everything that happened and starts to bring up the chicken coop. Julia shuts her up and when reaching out to her, Julia recoils, spinning, 
I don't want your devil on me. Sigario remains in the room praying over her, but not exactly willing to chat. She convinces her to fetch Takoro's photo from the box. She touches it and thanks to what definitely seems like new powers, is able to now learn the tragic tale of what befell her. It was her that was getting brutalized in the chicken coop and realized now that this room used to be hers as well. The incident left her pregnant and scared and only the sisters knew about what happened. They do deliver the baby and make sure to keep this whole thing hush hush. The girl will never be able to leave these walls. Julia runs into Mother Superior, breathlessly informing her that Narcissa knows everything. She rips off her bandages and cleans her wounded eyes. There's a knock at the door and the floorboards clatter. Is there something there? She asks. There's another nun behind her, resembling Socorro from the picture, and she floats up from behind. Her skeletal hands hold out a bouquet and Narcissa reaches out for them. The connection floods her mind with more memories a few years later. Socorro's daughter is being taken away while her mom sobs from inside her locked room to please let me see her. It seems the girl is ill and Socorro has insisted on taking her to the hospital. The nuns aren't willing to do that, but know they need to bring her fever down. The girl could die. She screams for her mummy as they force her into the tub. They tell her not to resist. It's for your own good. Her mom screams and cries, an anguish so profound the girls can hear it now, causing the door to slam closed. Julia takes the girls in her arms and the screaming resumes much more intensely. The nuns still struggle with the girl and she gets knocked to the side with a loud crunch. Eee. She is instantly dead, slumping lifelessly into the water. Socorro can feel something is wrong and absolutely loses it. The nuns are distraught at the situation, even brought to tears. Her mother can't handle the grief and in the process, the chair knocks over. Now we know the sources of all those various noises heard throughout the school. The noises in the room were related to Socorro when she lost her daughter and the crying child was the daughter she lost. Both of their spirits clearly at unrest. Narcisa gives her a heartfelt apology and in the past, Julia discovers her already dead. She falls to her knees and begins to recite the Lord's Prayer. In the memory of her, the banging echoes. She screams and the girl gets dragged away once more. Narcisa looks furious now and the chair flips back up, hearing Socorro begging for help. She follows the voice and somehow she is on the other side of that locked door. She begs to see her daughter and needs to get her to the hospital. Narcisa assures her that she's here to help and puts a hand on the door feeling for the key. She unlocks it and the door creaks open, meaning the spirit has finally been unleashed. Probably not going to be good for those nuns though. A large shadow looms over her, blocking the light just like the eclipse. Past Socorro comes to, showing off a bloody tooth grin. She begins to chuckle to Julia's horror, the laughter growing more maniacal. In the present, we hear the same laughter and Julia sends the kids back to bed. Narcissa is right outside. She's here. I open the door and let her out, she informs her. Julia is rattled to her core. She can't believe what she's done. In the past, Julia runs down the very same hall. She stops in her tracks, coming to a dark robed nun. She encounters the same thing now with Narcissa by her side. Meanwhile, Mother Superior prays to the hand in hopes of quickly absolving her guilt. Like, can I please get some forgiveness real quick? God, this thing's about to kill me. Come on, dude. Her earlier self is at the bathtub, the water blood red now, and the child missing. Julia finds herself in the storage area, and a bell tolls. There's a sound of chalk on a chalkboard, and the lamps shake back and forth in the room. A name is scrawled on the board, and I'm sure we can guess whose it is. One figure amongst the collection starts to move on its own. Mother leans over the tub, and a pair of swampy clawed hands grab at her, and she starts coughing up blood in the present. Mother is dragged under the water, her now coughing up more watery red stuff, and Mother collapses on her desk. Julia does the Holy Trinity in both time periods, and a statue falls right on her face, smashing it to bits. She falls down dead, along with her partner in crime. Morning breaks, and Socorro comes to the tub and retrieves her little girl, bathed in a blistering white light. Now reunited in the afterlife, Narcissa smiles, and the light completely takes over. Well, she did something good. Static pops back to footage of her as a child, holding her arms out in the sun. We then move on to Narcissa, much older, where she works at a school in 1991. A teacher introduces her as someone special to her. Back when she was around their ages, she helped her to understand the convent was not her true calling. Yeah, well, I'll bet after the experience she had, the teacher is overjoyed to have her here and to teach everything that she knows. And we see Veronica amongst the students. Her friend jokes about her frightening appearance, saying that she looks more like Sister Death, leading us directly into the events of Veronica. Now we know the story of how Narcissa became Sister Death, and if you want to see what happens next, click here to watch my video on Veronica. And if you have any requests for movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain, send them my way. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.